Pray with me for the doc doctors working with her, that you would give them increased skill and ability to work with her. God, we pray for no complications, for a quick and full recovery for her and for peace this week as she goes through surgery. God, we pray for Barry, for his leg, that you would bring him healing. We pray for Julie as well to guide her and strengthen her. God, this morning we pray for all this people on our hearts and minds. Those who have spoken this morning and those who have not. And so, God, we trust them to you, asking for you to work in their lives in mighty and powerful ways. And, God, we do think of Sherry in this morning as well, that you would be with her in her treatment. So, God, we pray for this morning that we would hear from you. God, that you would open our hearts and our minds and speak to us. Draw us near to you that we may know your forgiveness and your grace and, and your love in real and powerful ways this morning. So God, we love you and we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Growing up, one of my favorite games to play was a game called Guess Who? Maybe some of you played uh, Guess Who before. We have this card of a person. Mason's played this before, and your opponent has a card of another person. And you have to ask them questions to see if you can guess who they have before they guess who you have. So today we're going to play an easier version of Guess Who. I have up here on the screen uh, a picture of several different people. And so um, I just want you to shout out who's up on the screen. So go ahead and just shout out. Who do you see up on the screen? LeBron James. Albert Einstein. Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. Martin Luther King. Jimmy Microsoft. Microsoft. Who's found with Microsoft? Everyone know. Bill Gates. Are we missing one? Did you guys see the musician? Mozart. It's actually Beethoven, but that, I'll take Mozart. That, that works too. So, great. So we have these famous people up here on the screen. Um, now, who can tell me what these people are known for? Like, why are they so famous? Why do all, almost all of us know who they are? So let's start with, like, oh, did someone shout it out? Mason, go for it. What did you say? Well, why is he famous? What's he known for? Or he was just a really smart guy, right? Like, he was really great with math and science. Yeah, really smart. Okay, what else? What about, like, LeBron James and Babe Ruth? What are they famous for? Sports, right. Great athletic ability. Uh, what about Beethoven? Music, right? Um, what about Bill Gates? Technology. Yeah, good. Uh, Yes, you, yeah, what was he famous, Barry? He famous down in Washington, D.C. For a great speech, speech order, great leader of the civil rights movement, right? Mother Teresa. Yeah, great humanitarian, great compassion. So all of these people are extremely talented, right? We know them because of their talents, whether that's intellect or sports or compassion, extremely talented. So this morning, I want to tell you, church, that you are also extremely talented. Now, you might be thinking, like Hannah, like, I'm not nearly as talented as, like, LeBron James or Albert Einstein. But before you start comparing, comparing your talents, I want you to know that you are talented. Every single one of us is talented. Now, we have different talents, right? Our talents might not be like LeBron James or Bill Gates, but every single one of us is talented. So what do you think about, just for a moment, what are your talents? What are you good at? By talent, I simply just mean this special ability to do something well. All of us have talents, right? Whether it's working with our hands, like we're good at building things or fixing things or crocheting or we're good at baking or cooking or raising children or teaching children, good with numbers. There's so many different things that we're good at, that we're talented about. So I want you to think about your talents. What are you good at? But I also, this morning, want you to think about what is your superpower? By superpower, I simply mean an excessive or superior power to do something very special. This is like something you're like wired to do. Like you do this and it gives you life and it blesses other people. Like this is a unique gift to you. So um, I want you to think about this. And I actually have some questions in your bulletin that you can look over, because some of us don't always know, like, what is my superpower? What am I uniquely gifted to do? And so I want you to think about these questions to help identify your superpower. So the first question is, what are your passions? What are you passionate about? Like, what keeps you up at night? What gets you up, in, up early in the morning? What just really gets you excited about life? What are you passionate about? Then I want to think about your needs. What do you need? to 
be a healthy, healthy, happy, flourishing individual. So maybe you need creativity, or maybe you need independence, or maybe you need community, or flexibility. What do you need in your life to help you thrive? Then think about what are your characteristics? How would you describe yourself? How do other people describe you? What kind of person are you? Are you kind, smart, funny? What are some of the characteristics in your life? Then think about what are your longings. If you could wave a magic wand over your life and the world and everything would become perfect, what would you long to see? What are some of your deep longings that you would like to see in your life and in the world? Then I want you to think about your achievements. What are some things you've already accomplished in life? And sometimes what we've already achieved in life can give us insight into our superpower, this power that we have to do something exceedingly well. So it's my hope that you'll think about those questions, perhaps this morning or the, this week ahead, to think about your superpower. Maybe for some of you, you are a nurturing leader, or maybe you are a generous baker, or you are an inspirational innovator. I'm not sure what your gifts are, but I want you to think about what's your unique superpower this week. So as you're thinking about your superpower, I want to tell you a story. It's a story that Jesus told in Matthew 25. And I'm going to tell it with a little modern twist this morning, so it's probably going to sound familiar, but a little different. And so I'm going to tell you this story because it helps answer two questions. The first is, what, where do our talents come from? And that's the first question. So listen to the answer to that question as I tell this story. The second is, what are we to do with the talents that we have? So as I tell this story, I want you to listen to the answers for those two questions. There once was a CEO of a company who was going away on a journey. The CEO called his three employees together and decided to give them shares of the company. To one employee, the CEO gave shares worth $5 million. To the second employee, he gave shares worth $2 million. And to the last employee, a share worth $1 million. Then the CEO left and went on his journey. As soon as the CEO left, the employee who received shares worth $5 million immediately went to work and started expanding the company, started investing and trading, and over time, what was worth $5 million was now worth $10 million. The second employee did the same thing. What was once worth $2 million, he was able to work and invest and multiply that to get it to become $4 million. The last employee, they all, though, on the other hand, decided to cash out his money, went home, dug a hole in his backyard, and put the million dollars in the hole in his backyard. The CEO, after a long time, eventually came back from his journey. So he called together those three employees to ask what they had done while he was away on his journey. <coughs> The first employee stepped forward and said, hey boss, you know that share of $5 million you gave me? I worked really hard and I multiplied it into $10 million. And the CEO was really happy about that. <coughs> the second employee who received the share worth $2 million said he did the same thing and turned it into $4 million. And the CEO was very happy about that and promoted both of those two employees <coughs> to take over even more ownership and share in the company. But the employee, who had just hid the million dollars in his backyard, came to the boss and handed him a dirty, muddy pile of a million dollars and confessed to the boss that he hadn't done anything with what the boss had given him. And the CEO was not very happy with this last employee, fired him on the spot, and took that pile of muddy million dollars and gave it to the employee who had made $10 million and decided that would be how the company I told you this story this morning because this is a modern telling of what we often refer to as the parable of the talents. Talents is simply a word for a large amount of money. It was like the biggest um, numeral, numeral value of money in the time of Jesus. And so that's why I use such large quantities of money when telling this story. It was meant to be a large sum of money, but when it got translated into English, we refer to talents not just as money, but all that we have, right? Our gifts and our resources and abilities. And I think it's appropriate to view the parable in this light. In this parable, in this story, Jesus is the CEO, and we are the employees. And I think this story answers these questions that it tells us where do our gifts come from, 
Well, our gifts come from God. That God gives us our talents. God gives us everything that we have, all that we are, all that we have, our financial resources, our gifts, our talents, abilities, all that comes from God. What that means is that your talents and gifts, they don't come just from your DNA or from your family or from your life experience or from your training or from your happenstance and, and fate. Your talents come from God. They're uniquely gifted and given to you. So if our talents come from God, then what are we to do with the talents that we have? Well, this story also answers that question, that we are to work to develop our talents. It's very clear in the story that those two employees who were faithful and diligent in working to develop what had been given to them and multiplying it, they were seen as successful and that was valued in God's eyes that they worked with the gifts given to them. But that one employee who just buried the talents in the dirt in his backyard, God was not happy with that person. I think this says to us that we are to work hard to develop the talents and gifts God has given us. God desires that for us. Not to be lazy and just to bury our talents, but to work to develop them. So what does this look like? So maybe you're talented at athletics, and so you should work and train to develop that gift as best as you can. Or maybe you're good with music, and so you should practice and sing and, and perform and play instruments and work at that as best as you can to develop that. Maybe you're good at teaching, and so you work to develop that, or with numbers, or leadership, or cooking, or baking, crocheting, whatever it is that you work and develop that talent that you have to the best of your ability. I think that's what God desires for us. But here's my next question for us. Oh, let me read this quote first. This is a quote I loved about developing our talents by a nun named Joan Chittister who actually lives in Erie, Pennsylvania. So I want to read this quote for you. To deny the abilities I have been given, thought, insight, wisdom, analysis, understanding, explanation, persuasion, is a virtual sin against creation. It degrades the virtue of humility to a kind of debased self-knowledge. It withholds from the human community the very gifts I have been freely given for its good. Having gifts is nothing if we don't use them. Let me say that one more time. Having gifts is nothing if we don't use them. To praise the Creator for seeding the universe with them is bogus if we ourselves fail to use them to their own. So Joan is reminding us to use our gifts, to develop them to their fullest potential. That is what I think God desires for us. And so this leads me to another question, which is what is the motivation behind developing our God-given talents? Or another way to say this is, is why develop our talents? Why does it matter? Who should we develop them for? And I think when we look at our world today, one answer would be, well, we're supposed to develop our talents for ourselves, right? Like, we should develop them to become the best that we can be, to become as successful as we can be, to achieve as much as we can do in life. And that's one way that we think about developing our talents. I think we've seen this a lot recently with the college admissions scandal that we've seen throughout the news uh, recently. And this, this scandal has shown us how achievement has become this, like, top and high value in American culture. As, as you've been following this scandal, you've heard about this guy, uh, William Rick Singer, who developed this organization named He, under this false pretense, this is what's really sad to me, that he developed this organization under the guise that it was helping underprivileged students, but really it was just this fake organization so that rich people could funnel their money through that to bribe college admissions and officers and athletic coaches to get their students into the school of their choice. It was uh, alleged that one couple paid $500,000 in bribes to get their two daughters into the University of Southern California and to be on the rowing team even though neither one of them had ever rowed in their life. This is the kind of uh, corruption that is going on where people would pay $500,000 just to get their students into the school of their choice. But what that highlights, I think, in our culture is that we will do sometimes whatever it takes, even act dishonestly, to try to succeed and try to get ahead in life and try that for our children as well. And so that we just want to achieve and succeed and get more and more inclined this ladder of success in American culture. Think about it. Think about the questions we ask one another. Like, what do you do for a living? 
Where did you go to school? How many degrees do you have? How many books did you write? Right? It's all about this achievement of what you have achieved and pursued in life. And let me say this morning, if you're here this morning and you haven't decided to follow Jesus, then you are free to keep pursuing that path of achievement. That is the way of our American culture to, to try to strive for more and more. And if that's what you seek, then you are free to do that. Let me just say a word of caution that there have been many stories, I'm sure that you have heard as well, where people have chosen that path of achievement to seek after uh, their own success and status, and they have achieved it. They've gotten to the top where we'd say, you have arrived, where they're wealthy, rich, and famous, and well-known, and seem to have everything that a person could want. But we hear these stories that even when they get to that top of the achievement ladder, they feel unfulfilled and unsatisfied, and some of them even take their own life. And so you're free to choose that path, but let me just caution you that it might not have as glorious of an ending as you might think. But this morning, for those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus, I think we have to take a different path. Jesus tells us this parable of the talents that I told this morning, but right after Jesus tells that story in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells this other story and these other powerful words. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to open up to Matthew 25. I'm going to read these powerful words of Jesus. This is Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31. And listen to how these words speak to us about why we should develop our talents. Hear these words. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him. He will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, and gave you food, or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, that you are accursed to depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that I saw you hungry? or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you. Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. <coughs> these are powerful, difficult words of Jesus. That challenge us, because sometimes I think we think that all that matters in life is that we believe with Jesus in our minds. That all we have to do is believe that Jesus is the Savior and Lord of our life, and that's all that matters. While that is extremely important, and that is where I believe our Christian journey begins, it cannot stop there. We've talked about this before, but our knowledge of Jesus must move into our hearts to change our lives, and it must flow into our hands for us to be willing to be open to serve others, especially the least of these. 
What's so powerful to me is that Jesus tells us your gifts come from God and God expects you to work and develop them. And then right after telling us that story, Jesus says you're to serve the least of these. Why does God give you your gifts? Why does God want you to develop them? Not for yourself and not for your own achievement and not for climbing the ladder of success in our American culture. God has given you talents to develop, to serve, and to bless others. God has given you your gifts that you can be a blessing to other people, especially the least of these. And what does that look like? It doesn't have to be these big, grandiose things. We don't all have to be like Mother Teresa. We're not all called to be like Mother Teresa. Notice the examples that Jesus gives. They're pretty simple examples, right? Like feeding somebody who's hungry or giving somebody who's thirsty a drink or visiting somebody who's sick or in prison. These are fairly simple things that every single one of us can do. And so if you're good at cooking or baking, work and develop that gift so that you can feed people who are hungry. If you're good at knitting or sewing or crocheting, work at that skill so that you can clothe those who need it. If you're good at leadership, develop that gift so that you can lead a nonprofit or teaching so that you can help underprivileged children. Or if you're good with making money or figures, do that and so you can give generously. Use whatever gift, whatever superpower you've been given, not for yourself and for your glory, but for building up other people to make their lives just a little bit better. That's, I think, what Jesus desires for us. This can look really simple. I thought of this example of my grandmother, who one of her gifts is she's good at knitting. And to my knowledge, my grandmother has never knit anything for any one of us in the family. We don't really need it, so she's never done that. But she will knit all winter long these little hats for babies in need in her community. That's a simple example where she's using a talent, something she's good at, to the benefit of other people, to bless them. I want to close this morning with one final story. There once was this man named Martin. Martin was a Roman soldier who also happened to be a Christian. One day when Martin was entering into a city, he saw a shivering homeless man by the city gate. Martin didn't have a lot on him at the time, but he did have a coat. And so he took his Roman soldier coat, as tattered and, and worn as it was from the years of wearing it, and cut it in half and gave half of it to the shivering homeless man. That night, Martin had a dream. And in his dream, he saw Jesus and the angels together. And he noticed in his dream that Jesus was wearing a Roman's coat. And one of the angels asked Jesus, Jesus, how are you wearing that tattered Roman soldier's coat? Jesus looked at the angels and said, my servant Martin gave it to me. Church, you are talented. God has given you unique talents that you should work to develop, not for yourself, but to bless others. Because by blessing others, you will bless Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the gifts that you have God, we pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to work to develop those gifts. God, don't let us to be lazy or apathetic, but to continue to develop our gifts no matter how young or old we are. God, I just pray that you would give us the strength to do that. God, give us the motivation to develop our gifts to bless others, not to build up ourselves, but to build up our people. That when we use our gifts, especially on behalf of the least of these, that we bless you. So God, I pray for that this week that you would guide us and strengthen us in that endeavor to serve you with all that we have and all that we are. In Jesus' name we pray.